The Man of God Network exists to help the church in her mission to identify and equip qualified, faithful men for the gospel ministry and for the recovery of biblical reformation in our day. It's our joy to provide you with resources that both encourage you and edify you as you seek to build Christ's church where you are, to the end that He is better known, loved, and exalted. We appreciate the support of our listeners. To learn more about how you can help us accomplish our mission, visit manofgodnetwork.com. Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. We pray you find this resource edifying, faithful to Scripture, and Christ-exalting. Now, let's get started. Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. Austin McCormick here, and today I have the privilege to speak with Christopher Ellis Osterbrock. Welcome to the podcast, brother. Welcome. Thank you, Austin. Very yeah, and here. The topic of our conversation today is, uh, the title at least, is A Brief History of Dissenters by Joseph Ivamy. As we continue in this conversation, our listeners will uh, figure out why the episode is titled in that way. But before we uh, get into our topic, uh, since you are a first-time guest to our show, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, brother? Oh, yeah. I am a uh, Baptist pastor by, uh, by vocation. And I, I delve into history. Um, I consider myself an amateur historian. Uh, that's my my joy and uh, my hobby is is Baptist history and um, you know a little bit of systematics thrown in there. And uh, I am uh, I'm pastoring right now uh, and and prayerfully uh, for the rest of my tenure at uh, First Baptist Church of Wellsboro, Pennsylvania. I've been here for about three months and. Uh, Prior to that, I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, for uh, in in ministry for uh, twelve years. So, I'm I'm fresh to Pennsylvania, fresh to hunting culture, and uh, lots of farmland and lots of mountains. Um, I don't think that's relevant to the dissenters necessarily, uh, but uh, I, I had the the joy of editing uh, Joseph Ivamy's work. Um, I don't want to jump too far in there, but uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm a father of three little girls, uh, six, four, and one, and uh, my wife and I, um, we we're a homeschool family. I, I'm not sure what else is interesting about me, but uh, but uh, yeah, we're in, in the Charlotte Mason world, in the publishing world, in the uh, copy editing world, uh, all of that kind of stuff, as well as in ministry uh, full time. Well, thank you for that, and it is uh, a joy to get to speak to you today, so thank you once again for coming on, Um, and in your response to my first question, as you told our listeners a little bit about yourself, you did mention that uh, you have edited a book uh, by Joseph Ivamy, and that is the topic of our discussion primarily today, A Brief History of Dissenters by Joseph Ivamy, republished by Hesed and Amet, so... Uh, you and another brother, Chance Faulkner, who we've had on the show previously to talk about, uh, James Hinton, edited this work for republication. Um, can you tell our audience a little bit about that process? Yeah, that is. Uh, it's always interesting uh, the, the reprint style, and I, I work with reprints uh, with H and E, so uh, I'm the project manager for reprints. And Chance and I had had a joy in, in going over Joseph Ive and me. Uh, this came out of uh, a desire to get get reprinted uh, the history of English Baptists, which is uh, Ivamy's uh, four volume work. Um, we're editing that uh, to make it into seven volumes, uh, make it a little easier for the reader. But we chose a brief history of dissenters because it's such a a nice, concise picture that Ivamy gives, and we wanted to make that not necessarily a modern reprint. So we're not rephrasing everything, uh, but we do go, go through and we find archaic words or words that uh, might mean something different now uh, to, to modern readers and, and adjust those. Uh, we go through and change punctuation. There, there's quite a difference in the long 18th century way of uh, putting a sentence together uh, or, or for a treatise or, or what have you, and, and then looking at it today. Uh, those guys would fail uh, a lot of grammar school that we would understand and 
uh, or English 101 at college level. Um, but Ivan Mee writes in a really, really important way. He, he, he writes kind of like a, a sermon in his doing history. So uh, we wanted to make that easy for the readers. And um, so part of that also includes changing headings, changing subheadings, uh, adding those in, adding chapters. We did all of that for this work. And so it's not a pure, uh, a pure reprint. There is modernization, but it's as slight as possible. And it, it, it keeps intact the flavor of Ivmi's writing. Yeah, nice. Uh, so you've told us now a little bit about uh, your interest in republishing works, and uh, we've introduced the topic of our conversation a little bit by talking about the work specifically that has been uh, republished, A Brief History of Dissenters by Joseph Ivamy. But uh, now that you've told us about yourself and uh, this process, can you tell us a little more about uh, Joseph Ivamy? At the Covenant Podcast, we uh, love Baptist history. And so we're especially interested to hear about Joseph Ivamy. So who was this brother? Yeah. Uh, Joseph Ivamy, uh, Chance and I wrote a, the introduction to a brief history uh, of dissenters. And, and his life is really fascinating because he was a, a second career pastor. Uh, so he was a tailor prior to that, but uh, <clears throat> Ivamy, without giving a kind of a chronological history of, of the man in its entirety, uh, he was brought up outside the church. Uh, he came to faith uh, somewhere in his, his teens, early 20s, and uh, he was an athletic guy. Uh, he was apprenticing because his dad was bad at finances and uh, was more interested in, in um, yeah, I talk about modernization. Uh, you can kind of picture their family out in the suburbs. The dad is taking out too much uh, credit to look the part, to, to look like a, a nice gentleman uh, with his nice vehicles and um, you know, anachronistically. But uh, so Joseph had to work to, to help his family. He very quickly went from being in athletics, uh, grammar school, all that. He, he wasn't very keen on all that stuff. So he, he goes into the tailor trade and along the way uh, he, he comes to faith. And uh, one instance that Chance notes at the beginning of the introduction to Brief History of Dissenters is uh, he gets attached to an Isaac Watts hymn. Uh, he, he really likes that hymn and um, it, he really felt that that he was called to, to the faith. And he starts working in that and um, he gets this external call, I uh, noticed uh, these other these other men in his life uh, start telling him, oh, no, this is, it looks like you're headed toward ministry. So he begins the work and he, he's looking at himself as a, as a strong uh, lay person. And um, then it just keeps the way that the, the way that the Lord works in Providence, he keeps pushing him uh, further. And, and at a time where he's thinking, well, I'm, I've got a lot of young guys, a lot of young church planters, a lot of these Baptist kids are coming up and, and getting into ministry. Uh, wh what does that mean for me? Uh, he eventually uh, gets called into to work under uh, another brother. He be, becomes kind of the associate pastor. And uh, within a year, he's taking on uh, the ministry full time and uh, selling his, his trade uh, with his family. And, um, so he, he, through that, uh, he gets connected. Uh, he, he ends up at Eagle Street, London, and he gets connected with a lot of the London Baptists at that time. And we see him pictured with uh, Andrew Fuller uh, before Fuller's death in 1815. Uh, he has a knack for, uh, which you see this show up in his life repeatedly, he has a knack for recording things and, and taking that record and applying it to what's happening in the day. And uh, brief history comes out of his desire as soon as he gets involved in his church. In 1809, he has a sermon lecture uh, for Eagle Street um, to kind of share Baptist history with his people. This is why we are who we are. And he calls it motives to gratitude. And it's we should be grateful for our history. We should remember our history. We should be grateful for uh, these men uh, that that came up and were persecuted, and we're not facing that same level of persecution today. Uh, praise the Lord! Uh, so let's be grateful and and let's be charged with this desire to hold on to our history. And um, so, uh, 
I'm sorry, I'm kind of sporadic all over the place here, but uh, Ive Me uh, begins that kind of recording history there. And he likes to see himself as a background character. And he likes to see himself as taking place in something larger than himself, uh, which is his love for history is not rooted in, let me get all of the dates recorded correctly. Uh, let me do this unbiased approach in historiography. Uh, let's just look at the, the context. He, he's very much concerned with, with doctrine, uh, with doctrinal precision, uh, with a regard for why are these men important to me? And uh, not just what's the history of these men, but wh what do they do for Eagle Street today? What do they do for uh, Baptists living in London, uh, seeking to go forward in ministry, seeking to evangelize, seeking to grow their church? Um, and so he has this knack for processing information uh, as it makes sense to him in that day. And uh, I believe that that was part of the reason why men like Fuller and um, men like um, Pierce, Carey, all, all those all those good brothers, uh, the Baptist Missionary Society, they called him and appointed him to, to work as secretary. And he worked under Andrew Fuller. Uh, he, he recorded, uh, he worked with the Sarampur um, mission in India. And, and you, we see him taking, taking charge really there and making that his own work. And as he's doing that, uh, people respond very well to him. And after his uh, motives to gratitude, after that, uh, that sermon, uh, he prints it in 1809. And, and we see him kind of sit back and think and realize this is exactly what I want to do. I want to be recording Bap the Baptist Missionary Society. I want to be recording uh, all these other mission works that are happening. I want to be uh, taking all the, all the letters that these guys are writing and uh, all this correspondence that we have. This is our history. This is Baptist history. We have to be uh, making sure that everyone remembers this and, and uh, records this for the day. And you see that he, he's looking ahead saying, there's going to be guys in 2022 who are going to be talking about this stuff. We need to make sure it's, it's pristine. And so he takes, he takes that role of secretary. He takes all the correspondence from the Sarampur uh, correspondence. He edits that. Uh, he takes his motives to, gra to gratitude and um, publishes that and then says, I'm going to put together a four volume set. He says that the answer at the outset, I'm going to put together a four volume set of where Baptist came from until today. And you get it in the last volume, uh, even sporadically through the, the other, um, not the first volume, but sporadically through the other volumes of his history of the, of the English Baptists, you get over and over again, um, this connection. He, he's seeing the London Baptist Church. He's interjecting in the history saying, and, and so therefore we need to remember this. Therefore we have uh, this church over here. And, and he's making all these uh, connecting dots uh, with regard to the London Baptists. And through that adventure, uh, Ivamy continues and persists uh, in um, Eagle Street uh, Baptist Church. Uh, he sees, um, I can't remember exactly, over, the, over his span, um, just a dramatic increase in, in the membership and the roles. And this is a guy who Ivan me was on the, on, on the very, um, if, if there's a continuum there on, on open communion, closed communion, he is as far in closed communion as you could possibly be. And um, I, I just, I, I really take that to heart uh, to see his, his desire to really ground his people in the history of why they're meeting for communion, the, the history of why they're being evangelistic, um, answering that uh, the gospel worthy of all acceptation uh, from Fuller, uh, Ivan is taking that very seriously, and and yet he's not he's not budging on doctrine. He's not budging on uh, this is what membership looks like. This is what communion looks like, and um, he's willing to fight. He's willing to write treatise after treatise on on closed communion, and um, so Eagle Street's growing dramatically. And, and he's really taking a part in the Baptist Missionary Society. He's really taking a part in missions work, and he begins to feel the necessity to, to move that forward in education. And so he opens up a lot of schools. He opens up um, a mission to, to Ireland, uh, which becomes a passion project for him. Um, along the way, as, as a side note there, uh, his desire for mission, he, he and his wife, his, I believe it was his second wife, his first wife died shortly after their marriage. Uh, but his second wife and him 
they were going to move to Jamaica uh, to work on the Baptist mission field there, but uh, that they didn't feel that that was the call. So Ireland it was, and Ireland he opened up, um, I, I make a note of it in the introduction. Um, I don't want to take up too much time trying to find that, but uh, he opens up like uh, And this is why I was asking you about editing so that you can <laughs> hear me flip through pages, uh, but that's, that's totally fine. Uh, he opens up um, several schools, 10,000 poor children in Ireland, 25 evening schools or 90, 91 weekday schools, 25 evening schools, uh, 16 schools for uh, women, uh, for females. And uh, that's Ivamy. Uh, you don't see Ivamy uh, being toted as the picture of Baptist mission. Uh, but as he's recording, as he's acting as the secretary, he's in Ireland, um, which at the time had no Baptists, very few Baptists. You had guys like Thomas Patient. You had uh, other guys like that. But um, there's such a such a need for Protestant Reformation in Ireland. And Ivamy is, is there uh, with his family, the supporting it. Uh, and this is a guy who's not raising as, as much funding as Kerry, as uh, as Judson would, uh, he's as as Pierce is raising for the rest of the Baptist Missionary Society. Ivmi is taking this on almost single handedly. He he pulls in a lot of other folk because he he desired to see them take charge in leadership. But this is something on his own that he's working toward. And uh, during that time period, he was also the editor for the Baptist Magazine, and so he included an Irish Chronicle. Uh, making notes. Uh, you can you can kind of picture that, right? You see that language. He's uh, he's being the historian for his own Baptist mission and uh, taking notes, collecting letters, saying this is what these fellows are doing. This is what's going to be important later on because we are in fact part of uh, this history that's happening here, uh, connecting it back. Um, so Eagle Street, very successful. Uh, his, his Irish Baptist mission, very successful. Those schools, very successful. Uh, he begins writing uh, not just on the history of, Bapti uh, of, of the Baptist movement, but he begins writing on um, bi biographies. And during that time where he's really focused on those weekday and, and evening schools, he uh, puts together a biography of William Fox, who's an educator, uh, who, who was really uh, unique in his Sunday school approach. Uh, he puts together a uh, a lot of other biographies of men that he found to be very special and important. And so he's putting together um, a biography of William Kiffin. Uh, but uh, early on, uh, as he is writing it, somebody else publishes a biography on William Kiffin. And he says, oh, well, I'll just shove that in the drawer then for later. And um, if you look at, if you notice a lot of his works, I have a, a big long list of, of some of his works here, but um, He's got dozens and dozens, and um, you, you see by those dates and you see by the publishing, uh, he's doing this by himself. He's raising the funds and, and putting the stuff out there just because he wants it to be out there. And so eventually he releases his William Kiffin. Eventually he releases a biography on John Milton. Um, eventually he releases a, a, a collection on, um, he, he had a lot of Roman Catholic works, um, kind of looking at their history and how it, how it affects Baptist history. But um, he also has a, a biography that's a, a continuation of the Pilgrim's Progress where he's uh, noting history as if coming, coming forward from the, the days of persecution and looking back at what, what the modern pilgrims, he calls the pilgrims of the 19th century, uh, what they're facing today. And um, so Ivamy is really attached to this history idea, to this idea of a methodology for producing history for the local church. All of this is meant to be for the local church. It's not meant to be necessarily for, uh, for his um, contemporary uh, men fighting alongside him. It's for them, but it's, it's more for uh, Eagle Street needs to know where they came from. Um, those who are, who are buying these books need to know what Baptist history is. Uh, we've got lots of Presbyterians, we've got lots of Puritans, we've got lots of other nonconformists, but Baptists need to need to know where they come from. And so uh, his last days at Eagle Street were spent writing, spent uh, finishing his fourth volume of the History of English Baptists, his uh, other uh, 
other works. Uh, he wrote a lot of prefaces for, for other guys. He continued writing articles under different names for the Baptist magazine. And at the time when, when he really feels his health is uh, deteriorating, he puts in charge uh, Robert Overber Overbury and um, gets ready to to release and, and relinquish a lot of his control that he had. So he, he steps away from the Irish society, he steps away from uh, the educational societies that he was attaching himself to, and he steps away from Eagle Street eventually. Um, he preaches a little bit here and there, but uh, eventually he passes away in 34, 1834. And um, interestingly enough, four, four years before he passes away, he, he remarried, his second wife had died uh, that year and he remarries. Um, he was a man, he, he knew that he needed strong women in his life to help him uh, publish this stuff, edit this stuff. Uh, he needed that Susanna Spurgeon of the long 18th century. Uh, so uh, that's, I didn't want to go over the top, uh, but he, he's got a lot of, of wonderful, fascinating notes. And, um, you know, after, after a while, we could talk about his, his uh, contention with other, other magazines. Um, yeah, that was really helpful. Um, we really like the Baptists of the 18th century. We've had Dr. Haken on to talk about Samuel Pierce. Uh, we've had episodes on Andrew Fuller, and we've had episodes on uh, William Carey, but never before have we had an episode on uh, Joseph Ivamy. So uh, really thankful to have you on to, to tell our audience a little bit about him and his interest in Baptist history and this volume that uh, you and Chance have been, uh, that you worked on. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, this book a little bit more. So maybe we could get into the content within the book. Uh, what is what is this specific volume about? I know you've alluded to it a little bit, but what is it uh, specifically about? I'm the worst at asking our interviewees a triad of questions. So I know that technically <laughs> this is three questions at once, but um, what is this specific volume about? Historically, what did it mean to be a dissenter? And... How did dissenters suffer for their faith, according to Ivamy? This gives you the opportunity to take the triad wherever you want to take yeah, it. Yeah, uh, thinking that through. Uh, what did it mean to be a dissenter? Uh, <clears throat> that is uh, hugely important to the topic. He, he begins, Ivamy begins by discussing uh, this is where the dissenters came from. And, and he looks at that as... Uh, he gets into it, and I know we're not talking about the, the first volume of, uh, of History of English Baptists, but he, he really connects that to uh, Henry VIII. He connects that to a movement of, of lots of like-minded people who were seeking nonconformity. And um, Ivamy stresses that, um, that this isn't just for Baptists. This is, this is a, a very important movement uh, for the restoration of the faith, for the coming against Roman Catholic tradition, coming against the Roman Catholic Church, but also coming against uh, the Church of England. And he sees Henry VIII, he sees that movement uh, coming into London. And the dissenters are those who would not, um, would not follow a book, you know, the Book of Common Prayer, would not follow uh, a regulation that is not biblical. And so that he wanted to express dissenters are those who are dissenting against a state church, uh, they're dissenting against um, a lack of religious liberty. They're dissenting against uh, protocols that are being put into place. Um, uh, he goes all through the work discussing those, um, what you wear, what you have at the, at the table, at the altar, um, what sort of prayers you're saying, um, whether they're your own prayers, uh, how communion is conducted, and uh, the membership of the church, whether that's a state you know, a state calling or whether that's a voluntary uh, decision to become a member of, of this particular church. And so he, he kind of uh, casts a wide net for what dissenting looks like, uh, but he very clearly articulates uh, the dissenters are a present force uh, that are being persecuted against in these various ways. And so a lot of the, there's a timeline at the, at the end of the book uh, that Chance and I put together that, that kind of gives you uh, here's Henry VIII and here are these different things that are coming up against the church, coming up against uh, dissenters. And uh, 
why why will they not just let dissenters be why why does there have to be a persecution against these people who are voluntarily choosing uh, to meet together to worship together and um what is the biblical attitude uh, towards those uh, is there an argument to be made or or is this a completely unbiblical argument uh, for persecution um, and um so that, that gives a bit about what the dissenters are, according to Ivamy. Um, how did the dissenters suffer for their faith, according to Ivamy? Um, he, he really touches on a lot of, uh, a, a lot of those acts, uh, the, the, um, uh, the Five Mile Act, the um, uh, Act of Uniformity, of course. He goes through the uh, just a long list of these different acts. And I mentioned Ivamy is really looking at history, his approach to history and his model for uh, not just studying history, but for writing it. And um, he wrote this, remember, he wrote this in 1809. And so at the end, uh, he comes back to it uh, before its publication. And um, it was at uh, 27. Um, yeah. 1827. He, he comes back to it and, and writes this appendix. And he says, look, I had, um, uh, I had prepared you all for this uh, Lord Sidmouth case. I, I showed you that this was going to be happening. And so now let me uh, write an appendix uh, critiquing this. Um, this is a man who saw himself. He is the dissenter. He, he is part of that history. And he's attached to the people that Henry VIII, Henry VIII was, was coming against. He's attached to the people that the, the Act of Uniformity was coming against. He's attached to these people that are now coming up in the, in the Corporation and Test Act. He's coming up he's with them all the way. And so he sees in his methodology, uh, I'm not just writing this stuff to show you what the past looked like. I'm writing this stuff to show you what the future will look like. And, and that is his approach in brief history of dissenters. And so he's saying, uh, these dissenters are suffering for their faith. We are suffering for our faith and we should expect that. And so as he's looking at uh, the ways that they're suffering, he's always pointing ahead to, uh, this is how we are presently suffering. Uh, these things are attached. If they suffered um, for because a book was telling them how worship ought to be done, and they didn't did not feel that that was, uh, they felt that that was coming up against their religious liberty. Uh, he's a man very concerned with re religious liberty. You read that all through the book, and you read that through all of his other writings. Um, he's saying that this is persecution. Um, this is suffering for your faith. Uh, you have to fight against this. You have to have to present a case. And if you're not if you're not suffering, so it's almost that, uh, you know, that, uh, that plague ridden Puritan world. If you are not suffering, then how do you know that you're persevering in the faith? If you want to experience perseverance, uh, then, then take up a torch and, and go to the, to the middle of, uh, of, uh, the house of commons and plead, you know, preach against them. And, um, so Ivamy is, is really calling to action. That's motives to gratitude. If I'm grateful, then I'm going to stand up in the House of Commons and fight this. And, and Ivamy shows that suffering as he mentions these men that come up and they preach sermons. They come up and they, and they find other guys who, who will stand and read letters before uh, George, uh, King George, and then read letters before King George III. And he has a lot of respect for King George III, which um, us and and. Pennsylvania, one of the 13 colonies, you know, we're, we're not having that, you know, King George is not a, not a pleasant person to us, but uh, to Ivan, he's saying, uh, we have gratitude for King George because he's, he is listening to us. He's listening to this persecution. He's listening to our suffering, our plight, and he is willing to take notice of it. And so Ivan, he really presents the cases for suffering as being uh, connected to how we are fighting for our religious liberty. And if we're not pursuing that religious liberty, um, we want to make sure that there can be lots of Baptist churches. We can make sure that our people are growing in their faith and and have the ability to do that without the without the the state church coming up against them. Um, we can go into specifics about each of those each of those acts and what they looked like. Uh, some of those were. Um, were looked at as here is how I'm easing that suffering for you. I pass an act of uniformity that says that you have to uh, wear these certain things, conduct your worship in a certain way. And, um, and now I'm going to alleviate that by, uh, by presenting uh, this other act. And, and, and we see that happen over and over again. And, it's, and really what all it's doing is uh, like the test act, the, the corporations act, the, the five mile act, all of those acts are really, uh, 
they're really um, specifying here is exactly how I'm hurting your faith. Here is exactly how I'm going to come up against you. We see this in, in Thomas Brooks and, and um, the Puritans. I'm sorry to go off on a Thomas Brooks rant, but it's important. Uh, the, those guys who are meeting in the Moorfields after the Act of Uniformity, after 1662, they're, they're thrown out of their churches. Uh, they're, they're, they've got parsonages. I mean, think of think of how devastating it is. I'm pastoring a church. I'm a nonconformist minister, pastoring a church, leading these people, shepherding these people, loving them, uh, coming up beside them in worship through uh, devastating events, through through the the Great London Fire of 1666, through the Great Plague of 1665, through the Act of Uniformity of 1662. I'm with my people, um, and the Act of Uniformity takes them out of their parsonages. It takes them out of their their financial stability, and and these men are yet leading their people through these devastating events and leading their people to worship. And then they come up with a covenantal act. Uh, uh, um, I think I pronounced that wrong. A uh, com- conventical act. And, and they're saying, uh, you cannot at all have any sort of meeting. You're out in the Moorfields, uh, which is uh, you know a few blocks away for, for Brooks's case, but um, you've got William Bridge, you've got all those other uh, good Puritan guys that we love, the predecessors to the Baptists. And, and, we're looking at this London town and, and all these people, these members of these churches are then meeting in the Moorfields. They're meeting in these, these meeting houses and this act comes, which is supposedly going to make them feel better. supposedly going to show that the, that the, the, the King Charles the second is, um, is working with uh, the, the churches of England. And, and what it really does is allows for people, allows for Christopher Wren as the rebuilding churches after the Great London Fire, uh, he is likewise going around marking churches that they can destroy. Uh, that's, not, that's not a typical thing that we read about in history, but uh, Christopher Wren is rebuilding the hundreds of churches. Uh, but at the same time, he, he's labeling these other meeting houses and saying, you can go in and destroy this. You can, you can take stuff off of these houses. You can go in and rip down their altars. You can go in and find their pews. If you need wood for a fire, go on ahead in. Uh, if they're meeting in here as Baptists, as nonconformists, as independents, if they're meeting in here, um, go on ahead. You're free to destroy this, this place. And so uh, the Moorfields meeting houses, we see time and again, uh, these acts are causing the people who don't like dissenters to come in and, and rip their stuff up, to come in and, and destroy their, their, their private property, uh, to, to take over their religious liberty. And so Ivamy is taking note of that and saying, each one of these acts is another act of persecution. It's not nullifying what they did. It's not saying that, that it's okay after this. It's saying uh, you still have uh, an entire uh, population who can come in and attack you. The Five Mile Act says you're not allowed to you're not allowed to conduct business if if you are um, choosing to be, continue to be a nonconformist. Then you do not have a right to these positions in government. You do not have a right to these positions in business. You do you do not have a right to to freedoms of certain taxes. You don't have a right uh, uh, to uh, to in some cases to marry. And, and so these acts are coming up against, mind you, the act of uniformity is still intact. At the time that Ivamy is writing, it's still intact. It's just that they've made these other amendments and allowed for it. Um, in fact, the act of uniformity is still intact today in 2022. Uh, there, are, there are lots of amendments to that that, that make it seem like it, there's, there's no law on the books against nonconformists, but no, it's, it's certainly still the case. And so Ivamy is, say, is showing uh, the suffering that we're taking part in is is um, is good because it's a fight for what is right and what is good and and to fight for our history. Um, I I hope that that Puritan rant helps in some way show show the passion that Ivan me is, is dealing with. He's saying we have to go to the House of Commons. We have to to get people to read our letters. We have to. And he's not coming up as as in fighting, saying we need to go blowtorch the whole House of Commons. We don't need to go in and. and um, you know, Molotov cocktail, the, 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 the church of England, he's saying we need to go in and reform. We need to continue reforming. We need to go in and say, guys, this, this is your church. This is Jesus Christ's church. Uh, not cut us some slack. No, get rid of these acts that are, that are keeping uh, people from the body of Christ. Um, there was a triad. I think I got two, maybe one and a half. I don't know. Um, no, that, that was helpful. Um, 
to you, it may have felt like a rant, but I think that that answers the question. And I think that that's really helpful to understand how um, Ivamy was describing the suffering that dissenters went through. So thank you for uh, that answer. Um, it's obvious that you're very passionate about Ivamy and Baptist history, and uh, you yourself are a Baptist pastor. So um, yeah, these are good it, things to, to care about. Um, in a place but, like America, we, we're not facing that. Um, and, and it would do us well to, to recapture that, to, to think through those thoughts, to think through what it means to, to, be, to have that religious liberty. Uh, you know, what, what are we willing to fight for uh, in, in, in our worship? What are we willing to fight for? Because we don't have to fight for it. We, we don't put as much pressure um, on people to think that through. Hmm. Well, in relation to what you said, um, do you have any other tips for recovering Baptistic works or our Baptistic heritage, or at least um, in thinking about Ivamy's uh, interest in Baptist history, do you have any tips for being a well-informed church historian? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think through the... Uh, I've got a bibliography sitting here about Joseph Ivamy and you know, looking through his list of works. And, and it's, it's so important to remember that, that these, these men are as passionate as they are because they're writing uh, those questions out uh, for themselves. And excuse me, as Ivamy is, uh, as I mentioned, I hope that's, it's made clear. Uh, Ivamy is not looking at himself as a famed historian. He's looking at himself as a pastor seeking for uh, Eagle Street to have a, a deep knowledge. He believes that th if we want to know doctrinal truth, we have to know historical doctrinal truth. We have to know the history of it. We have to know the building of it. And, and, and as he says in his, uh, his dissenters, he makes mention of that. It's, it's not, it, he, he talks about the Apostles' Creed. He talks about Baxter and, and the Presbyterians. He talks about Owen uh, talking about the Apostles' Creed and the Ten Commandments and, and what are kind of the, what, what's kind of the shape of the faith. What he goes into Owen and, and Baxter dealing with um, the Westminster Confession. Uh, but, but he's, he's saying we have to get to a biblical understanding of, of that history. He's not saying the Westminster Confession is, is awful. He's saying uh, we need to go back and, and see uh, what uh, the precedent that was set uh, for defining our faith. And, and he was very concerned uh, of that. And he, and he wrote about that. And if we're going to gather up our heritage and gather up our history, if we're going to be concerned, if we're going to become passionate about it, uh, then we need to be writing for ourselves and we need to be recovering for ourselves and not, not to simply publish things for the sake of publishing them. I've me spent his own money and, um, and he wasn't a wealthy man uh, by any means. And he, and he spent his own time uh, documenting these things so that his church would understand, so that his church would know. And, and we see him in his, his reprints. Uh, he, he's concerned with reprints. He's concerned with those sorts of things. And uh, that's a joy to me uh, because it shows that this model for let's take up uh, an old work, uh, even for him, he, he, uh, in the beginning of History of English Baptists, the first volume, he, he just copies and pastes John Gill's uh, treatise on, on baptism. And, and that sets the course. That's his preface for here's the history of English Baptists, John Gill. And then he goes, he goes back to the Waldensians and, and uh, the, the, the Valley of Piedmonts, uh, these, these random things that we have no idea what, what to make of them. Uh, and, and he is, he's making footnotes and he's making uh, these connections and for us today, if we're going to recover Baptist history, we need to be mindful of modernizing, uh, not not diluting and um, and destroying what people have said, not taking out the flavor of their voice. Um, part of why we wanted to edit dissenters and, and add subheadings and headings is is to reveal uh, this is an important work and it's very it's very readable, but it's very relatable. Uh, this this is our history, and and so. Uh, to get into the work of a historian is, is to see what is useful to the church. And that means digging and doing the work, plotting, uh, as Baptists love to do, um, plotting through and, and taking note of what was important to, to men like Ivany, what was important to men like Gill, what was Im important to men like, like Keach uh, at that time and, and, and figuring that out. Um, we, we don't have people fighting like the, uh, um, 
third ecumenical council fighting over the uh, the natures of of Christ. Uh, you know, churches coming forward, sending their delegates, saying we need to fight, and this is look at all that's at stake. Uh, but but Baptists need to have that mindset that there are lots of things at stake that we need to put in press before our people. Uh, so doing the work of digging up those old volumes. Um, well, that was what I was going to say. Uh, the bibliography of Ivamy. Uh, there there are dozens and dozens of works that that have not been read since he published them. Uh, there there's volumes, there's letters, there's correspondence that that isn't that isn't noted, and that's to the det- to our detriment. And uh, being able to to recover that stuff um, just for our own people. Uh, that's that's the the reason behind history is is to present it to to our churches uh, that that it be remembered and and the reason why and if we can't give a good reason why then then why are we fighting for it in the first place uh, I mean, baptists believe in <laughs> what do baptists believe about communion well, well let's consider that if communion is important if we're going to do it once a month you know first sunday of every month um why do we do it? Why why do people have an issue with the wafers and the grape juice post COVID? You know, there's lots there's lots of things to consider and and to consider them uh, for the glory of God. Uh, anyway, that's that's helpful. Yeah, um, excited to hear about those tips of advice for recovering uh, baptistic works and baptistic uh, history. And uh, Hassan and Amet does a very good. Job H and E, I should probably call it H and E publishing <laughs> for our fun. for our uh, listeners does a good job of republishing and getting uh, Baptist works, uh, specifically reprints and other types of work into the hands of readers. So, uh, do you have any uh, final thoughts pertaining to our conversation or any updates related to H and E that you want to share with our listeners? Um. <clears throat> There's a couple things that are that are on the docket. Uh, H&E is working with uh, Andrew Fuller Society and um, with the London Lyceum to uh, put together what's called the John Gill Project. And those are um, reprints and there's an abridgment of, um, of John Gill's doctrinal divinity, uh, a body of doctrinal and practical divinity. Actually, it's a, it's a uh, one volume abridgment that's meant for pastors and, and lay leaders. Uh, there's also going to be a series of volumes, uh, six volumes we're, we're hoping um, to have out quickly. And I, I won't make promises on, on the, the quickness, uh, but uh, maybe before Christmas, uh, that would be wonderful. But uh, we're, we're working on uh, John Gill's um, spiritual characteristics, spiritual virtues that, that are labeled. Uh, he puts together the very brief little simple essays. And so we're having some volumes of that and also the introduction of uh, doctrinal divinity, body of doctrinal divinity. Uh, the introduction really asks the question, what is theology? And so we have that edit uh, coming out um, first for the John Gill project. And um, I'm acting as senior editor for that project. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. Wrote the style guide for it, which is uh, the nerdy copy editor kind of thing to do. Uh, I, I love that kind of stuff, making sure that it's readable, making sure that that we have the footnotes where we want them and all that. And um, uh, I, I should say we have a far better copy editor than myself who will be uh, handling the, the end result. But uh, th- th- those volumes will be very exciting to have out and, and very good for, for Baptists and, and even non-Baptists. Spiritual characteristics, virtues uh, like Christian fortitude, humility, uh, self-denial, resignation to the will of God, spiritual joy, um, all that stuff is is really helpful uh, for anybody who's who's in in the spiritual life and in, in, in the life of Christ. Um, also, we have the history of English Baptists, as I, I mentioned in the in the very beginning, a seven volume set that will be uh, edited. Uh, it will be a, be a very attractive set. Uh, we'll be putting out volumes uh, periodically, uh, kind of similar. Uh, not it's not a uh, critical edition. It's it's going to be far more. Um, readable um, to, to a lay person, um, hopefully, uh, but we add in the, the dates, we add in, you know, we take out those archaic words, we add in, um, uh, the, change the syntax a bit, but that, I think we've got volume seven that's just about ready, and uh, that, that'll be coming out. I don't have a timeline for you, but that's something to look forward to with regard to Joseph Ive and me. Um, but uh, H and E is is always working. Uh, there's always stuff that we've got in our queue to to be putting out to people. So, 
uh, make sure to check the website and see what else is coming out. Amen. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for giving us an update on H and E and, uh, in general, thank you for coming on the covenant podcast to discuss, uh, this work that has been republished and, uh, to give our listeners a whetted appetite on, uh, learning more about Joseph Ivamy. This has been a really, uh, pleasant conversation on this brother. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, no problem. Um, anytime. <laughs> And uh, to our listeners, we do uh, encourage you to check out this book on Hesed and Amet's website. Uh, we'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, until next time, we want to wish you grace and peace. For additional content, check out our blog ministry at covenantconfessions.com. Also, keep up with our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Lastly, Thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. Grace and peace to you.